from the Huntington Bank Studio. This is Colts 360. Vision game, boys. Let's go. Let's have a day. Nothing has been more week to week than this season. It's the NFL. Crazy stuff happens every week. Picked up by the Colts! We focus on what we can control, find a way to get win number 11. Every scenario involves Colts beating the Jags. Ah! It all is a moot point that we don't win. Play out football. This means something, man. We're focused on Jacksonville only, but our mind has got to believe that we're going to be playing more football after this weekend. Let's prove a damn point today, dog. Let's make a statement. What better chance to make a statement than today? We're a good team. We got one regular season game left. Our plan is to attack. Heck yeah! Woo! Finish strong. Welcome to this week's Colts 360, and we are kicking things off with head coach Frank Reich. Coach, the focus each and every week always on getting better and going 1-0. Within that, this week, what's the message going into the last week of the regular season with still an opportunity to get into the playoffs? Yeah, well, no doubt, Larry. I mean, this week, the message is you've really got to block out the outside noise. Everybody talking about all the scenarios, what has to happen, uh, and what we can – but it, that's all – irrelevant if we don't take care of our own business. So just focus on getting ready for Jacksonville. When you go back and have the opportunity to watch the tape from Pittsburgh, how do you channel some of the frustration or the disappointment from the things that could have been better executed in all three phases into motivation for this week, this opportunity against Jacksonville? Yeah, that's exactly what you have to do. You have to be critical of yourself. You know, each one of us has to be, you know, take responsibility for the, for the role that we play and the job that we do. So um, that's, that's what we do. I think every coach, every player really critiques, you know, we critique ourselves hard and, uh, and then you channel those mistakes and it really comes from a, Hey, I don't want to make, I don't want to be a repeat offender of that mistake. So let's learn from it and then figure out how we're going to do it right against Jacksonville. You talked about focusing in and not being distracted by all the different scenarios. How much of a sense do you get though, that Jacksonville wants to really come in and play spoiler this week? Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, you know, they're in our they're in our division, right? They they beat us the last two times they've played us. Um, I, we respect them. I mean, they, they've done a good job versus us, so um, they want to keep that mojo, and so that's going to be a big motivation for them, I believe, this week. And um, so we're gonna we know they'll come up here. We're gonna have to be at our best against them for sure. It's interesting in that you saw Jacksonville week one, you bookend the season with them week one and week 17. Whereas with the Texans and with the Titans, you saw those guys twice in a stretch of three weeks. So it's kind of funny how it all shakes out. That being said, how different is your team? How much has your team grown since that week one opportunity that you had down in Jacksonville? Yeah, that's a crazy question because I feel like, man, I feel like we've grown so much as a team. So much has happened, bad and good. Um, We've developed and matured in ways as a team, gotten closer. You know, you go through those highs and lows of, that you do in the season. And we're on the brink of, you know, having a chance to win our 11th game, which is a phenomenal season and um, to win 11 games. And we believe that uh, if we can do that, we're just trusting and believing that'll be enough to get into the playoffs. A lot of great wins in which this team has proven its resilience over the course of this season. Just thinking off the top of my head, the win over Green Bay, the comeback against Cincinnati, of course, both those Houston games. What has been instilled in this team to which it seems to have been built to rise to the occasion when your backs are up against the wall? Yeah, I think a couple things. Uh, you know, one is just the knack to make the big play when needed. Um, and then two is the, the belief and the confidence that it can come from any phase on our team, uh, that we're a strong team in, in all three units, special teams, defense, offense. At, at, at times this year, each one has played, uh, has played the major role in us giving, getting a win. And I think that makes us a strong team. You've been flexed to the 425 kickoff time, something we're familiar with. We had that happen for a couple of different scenarios on Sunday afternoons over the course of this season. That means that you could be watching the one o'clock games within the AFC that have implications for your own outlook for the playoff. How much will you pay attention to the to all of that? And then also what direction will you give your team on how much awareness or how much attention they give to those, those other games, those earlier games? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, God, I mean, it's interesting because we all get to the, you know, at the 425 game, we're getting to the stadium at about 1, 130 to get start to get ready for the game ourselves. So um, I, I know guys will be checking their phones and maybe there's a TV or somewhere where the volume's down and you're checking it. And, but my, my counsel will be, hey, don't get emotionally tied up in those games. I mean, I, I know we're going to watch and keep an eye on it, um, but we really got to focus our energies towards preparing for Jacksonville. So to the best that we can, um, just let it be background noise. Just further emphasizes what you've talked about on keeping things small and controlling what you can control, right? There's no doubt. And what happens is at the end of the year, sometimes the teams that can do that best without letting all that outside noise in, you know, those are the teams that play the best in the crunch. You'll have 10,000 strong at Lucas Oil Stadium at Lucas Oil Stadium, and certainly a whole lot of other committed Colts fans watching intently as a team. What do you need from those, those fans, your own fans who are going to be there in the seats, but also those watching elsewhere who you can feel that juice, even that they might bring from outside on Sunday afternoon. Well, I'm telling you what, uh, you know, Larry, we've had a number of games this year, like this game in Pittsburgh, we just played where there were no fans. And we've had multiple games where we've been at opposing stadiums where there's no fans. And so to play at home with 10,000 fans this year, it feels like there's 80,000. Um, I mean, there was no juice in that stadium last week, you know, and nobody there, good or bad, you know? So that's what we've been saying all year long. We got to bring our own juice. And, um, but Hey, our fans have been great, whether it's been 5,000 or 12,000 or 10,000, they've been bringing a lot of energy to the stadium. Our players really appreciate that. Bring all that juice that you can on Sunday afternoon. You got plenty of time to build up 425. That's just more time to get going, get that juice flowing before kickoff coach. Certainly appreciate the time. Good luck on Sunday against Jacksonville. Thanks, Larry. Up next on Colts 360, get to know Defoe. The defensive force of DeForest Buckner explains looking for revenge and a playoff berth against Jacksonville. That's next. Back now on Colts 360 and joined by DeForest Buckner. It is a busy week, Defo. we know, so we will get you in and out of here quickly, but wanted to catch up with you ahead of this matchup with Jacksonville. It's week 17, and you're now facing a team that you saw all the way back in week one. When you look back to the very beginning of this season, how much has this team grown from that point to now? Oh, we've grown tremendously from week one. Um, you know, we all knew that that, 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 that loss at the beginning of the season – uh, to start the season off was going to come back and haunt us a little bit. And, um, you know, we all had that sick feeling in our stomach, you know, um, being the the only team that they've beaten. And, uh, I mean, the growth on this team, you know, has – we've grown tremendously from week one um, just over the course of the season. Um, you know, how the bond that we've created and, and also just the, the energy that we play with um, each and every play and, you know, each and every game, um, it definitely shows on, you know, the film that you put on, you know, each and every game after that. And we, we knew we didn't come out with, you know, good enough energy the first time. And uh, we know we're going to get their best um, come Sunday. And, you know, um, we have a lot to play for. And these uh, everybody knows that. And, you know, everybody's going to go out, you know, give it their all. This team has been one in multiple occasions over the course of this season that has been able to rally. In the game against Cincinnati, you were mic'd up and you said, we're built for this. What is it about this team that has been built to rise to the occasion with backs against the wall in the situation that you're facing on Sunday? Yeah, just the trust amongst one another, uh, the uh, you know the resilience in each and every guy, and you know owning owning their mistakes and um, being being willing to you know to own up to it and do as much as they can you know to to be great at their job and to help the brother next to them and. Um, you know, that's what we're, you know, uh, adversity like that, that's what we're built for. And, you know, we, we've shown it multiple times, you know, the course of the season. And, um, you know, there's there's games, obviously, where we know we just beat ourselves. And, um, you know, we know what we need to do. Uh, each and individual knows what they need to do to, to help this team, you know, succeed. This brotherhood that you guys have built within the locker room is something that's really special. And one of the fun moments to watch each and every Sunday is that pregame huddle where Justin Houston gets in the middle of you guys, gives that pregame rallying speech. Mm -hmm. Take me to that. Take me in the middle of that and what that's like and what he says to rally you guys and fire you up. Yeah, Justin always knows how to, you know, pump the guys up and motivate us, um, you know, each and every game. Um, you know, he, he really just talks about, uh, you know, stepping on that field. You know, there's not one man on the other side of the ball that, you know, can stop us and get us in, get in our way. And, 
you know, the only, the only person that can beat yourself is your, you know, is you. And um, I, that's 100% true. Um, like I said before, I mean, the games that we've lost, I mean, we just hurt ourselves, you know, and, uh, you know, just being in that moment, um, you know, with, with the guys, you know, all huddled up. Uh, I mean, it's a special moment, you know, you be, being, you know, getting hyped up and getting ready for, you know, the game to start. Um, uh, he does a really good job with, you know, getting the guys to, to really, uh, you know, get fired up and ready to go. Being one of the newer guys in this defense, how has working with Matt Eberflus and Brian Baker impacted you most to the level at which you've consistently played, the very high level you've played in 2020? Yeah, um, Baker and Flus, um, you know, they're, you know, hell of a coaches. Um, you know, they're really good coaches. Um, they, they know, you know, they're willing to listen to the players and, you know, see their input and see where they can, uh, you know, make adjustments to, you know, put us in, in position to succeed. And that's what I really love about them. Um, you know, they're always looking for, you know, uh, ways to, you know, free guys up or, you know, uh, make make uh, those guys' jobs simpler so they can play faster. And, um, you know, that's what makes them great coaches. And that's what's helped us along the way to, to play fast and play great defense. I know it's been such a strange year that you haven't had the chance to interact in person with as much of the fan base as you typically would mm -hmm. and meet and greet scenarios and those community events and different things. But are you starting to get a sense of how much this Colts fan base has really embraced you, whether it's on social media or it's looking out at Lucas Oil Stadium and seeing those fans proudly sporting the number 99 jerseys? Oh, no, definitely. Uh, you know, I've definitely felt the the fan base, you know, the, you know, every, everybody's support throughout the season, and especially, like you said, in the, this type of environment and, um, you know, what we've been going through this year. But I've definitely felt the love throughout the season and the support by everyone, you know, in, especially on social media. So um, it's, it's motivated me a lot to, to even, you know, to play even harder, you know, just for the city of uh, Indianapolis. This has been a special time for you and your family. I know that you've come from a very big family, a very tight knit family, mm -hmm. but you welcomed your son this year. How special has it been to celebrate the holidays, even as strange as this the holiday season certainly has been, but to have him here for the Christmas time and being able to enjoy all of what the, uh, the special moments that this season brings. Yeah, it's just been amazing. Um, you know, uh, that's definitely the biggest blessing I've, I've received in 2020 was my son. Um, he's eight months now. And um, just to see him, I mean, obviously he's, doesn't really understand Christmas right now, but uh, to see him kind of, you know, really learn like, oh, open, you know, unwrapping these, you know, something fun comes out of it. You know, I don't know. It's kind of, it was kind of awesome to see. And um, just to see, you know, him, you know, him smile and everything um, definitely make Christmas a whole lot, you know, a whole lot better. And, um, you know, just ha having that addition to the family and uh, having everyone, you know, really be, you know, come, come out and, and support the family. Uh, it's been, been a lot, I mean, it means a lot, you know, especially in times like this. Well, certainly hoping that there's one more gift that we have to unwrap in the form of a victory on Sunday, DeForest. Appreciate your taking the time. Good luck against the Jags. Thank you. Appreciate you for having me. I don't think it's a mismatch. A lot of people do, but I don't think so. And, uh, and that's just me being, I don't know, I guess biased to, to myself. But whenever I line up against anybody, I, I know that things can go my way. Penny Moore breaks down the play. You know the one that ranks as one of the best plays the NFL has seen all year. Next on Colts 360. Colts cornerback Kenny Moore caught the NFL by storm with a catch of his own. That one-handed interception over Raiders tight end Darren Waller. In our latest director's cut, Kenny explains why he never saw that as a mismatch and breaks it all down for Colts Productions. Whenever I line up against anybody, I know that things can go my way. We were treating this game as a playoff game. I know what time it is. Y'all know what time it is. We cannot leave Vegas without a win. You want to come out swinging, and that's what they did. And he hits his man, Moreau, and scores! And watch with the hand. There's a hand right there from Kenny Moore, who's playing at a really high level. Connection made with Waller, stiff arm down the sideline. And a horse collar tackle on the play as well. Uh, I think this is my worst play of 2020. I don't want to say I panicked, but I, I just went into this weird way of just getting down. Then there was a penalty. That play cannot happen. It's going to move the ball all the way to the Indianapolis 15-yard line. Honestly, I was pissed. Um, the whole penalty and just being out of phase. The play before, I, I was so mad. I did not want to have another penalty. It was just a buildup, I feel like. 
Kenny Moore is 5'9", 179. Waller, 6'6", 255. And that is a physical mismatch. I don't think it's a mismatch. A lot of people do, but I don't think so. And, uh, and that's just me being, I don't know, I guess biased to, to myself, but whenever I line up against anybody, I, I know that things can go my way. Third down at eight here. The Colts are trying to limit the damage to a field goal. You got to use your coaching to the best of your ability. You got to bait. I saw a car staring down Renfro, and that's because he wanted to move me. But knowing who Waller was and in their scheme, and knowing whenever he get outside the 10, he wants to throw the ball into the end zone. And Waller, he's able to go get any type of ball there is. We all seen it. But as soon as I saw him throw the ball, I thought he was going to overthrow me. I said, oh my gosh, he's about to overthrow me. I was telling myself, like I said, the build up. I said, go catch it. No PBU, go catch it because I owe it to them. Somebody had to pay for it. Gonna air it out deep into the end zone. It is caught in a one-handed INT. Are you kidding me? As soon as I touched that ball, I just knew why I caught it. Everybody's going nuts, and I just throw the ball because I was that. I don't want to say frustrated. I don't want to use that word, but that was just an emotional time for me. And stole a touchdown pass away from Darren Waller. I think my photo back in junior was, uh, you know, playing defense for us, right? With that catch, I mean, that was unbelievable. He said he thought Odell back in junior was, was playing defense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Coach Wright got a lot of jokes and stuff. I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't go that far. It was one of those almost once in a lifetime catches, just a tremendous play. This play ranks number one. I mean, it has to, it's a turnover. It's overcoming the penalty, the, the, the missed tackles, the frustration and the emotion. This interception, you know, ended all that. And stole a touchdown pass away from Darren Waller. Kenny Moore, lightning in a bottle. We out. As we wrap up this week 17 edition of Colts 360, we had to bring in the voice of the Colts, Matt Taylor, to give us a preview of what is a wild Sunday afternoon, a lot of scoreboard watching, and a lot of business for the Indianapolis Colts to handle because this playoff scenario is something like we've never seen. It is wild, and I think we should start there, Lair, as far as the AFC. I mean, the parity in this conference is just out of control right now. I mean, there's only three teams heading into Week 17 that have clinched a playoff spot, representing the fewest in a conference since Week 17, 2013. I mean, normally we're sitting here talking about 10 wins. That solidly gets you in a six-team field. The fact that 11 wins might not be good enough to make a seven-team field uh, is just out of this world. So case in point, since 1990, when the playoffs expanded to six teams, the last 73 teams to start the season, 10 and four, all went on to make the playoffs. So here we go. There's five 10 and five teams vying for four playoff spots. Those, uh, those teams include the Colts, the Titans, the Browns, the Dolphins, and the Ravens. So in order for the Colts to clinch a wild card spot, they need to, of course, beat Jacksonville. Nothing happens without a Colts win. So they have to beat Jacksonville, and they need, they need to get some help. The Colts need to lose or have one of the following four teams lose in order to make the postseason. So the Browns need to lose at home against the Steelers. The Ravens need to lose against Cincinnati. Uh, the Dolphins need to lose in Buffalo against the Bills. Now, all of those games kick off at 1 o'clock, so the Colts will know if they're involved in a win and they're in meeting with the Jaguars uh, by the time they start their game at 425. So the NFL is all about the drama, so they flex the Colts-Jags game. They also flex the Titans and the Texans game to the 425 slot. That's important because if the Colts beat the Jags and the Titans lose in Houston to the Texans, the Colts actually win the AFC South layer for the first time since 2014. So again, it's just crazy that we're sitting here talking about the range of possibilities for the Colts in week 17 on one side. They can be division champs, host a playoff game, clinch the number four seed all the way on the other side of the spectrum. They can miss the playoffs with an 11 and five record. So it's just crazy to sit here that the range of possibilities is so wide. Um, so as of right now, the Colts are the last team out of the AFC playoff picture. So that means if all of those teams win, the Browns, the Ravens, Dolphins, and the Titans, the Colts actually miss the playoffs. So what are the odds of all of those teams winning? Fortunately, Lair, for the Colts, it's not good. According to the analytics website, 538.com, the Colts still have an 83% chance of at least grabbing a wild card spot. So bottom line, it's going to be a fun, wild week 17. 
The Colts don't completely control their own destiny. They got to beat the Jags, and Colts fans should be rooting for the Steelers, the Bills, the Bengals, and the Texans coming up on Sunday. I'd be remiss if I didn't drop a dumb and dumber. So you're telling me there's a chance, <laughs> Maytay. That's what you're telling me oh. here in week 17. A lot tip of things. Of, have listen, to go- tip of the cap to you on the dumb and dumber <laughs> reference. Hey, I appreciate you, Matt. And you can also follow along on all the Sunday fun day fun with us on the Bell Tire Radio Network. I will be on sidelines, your play-by-play voice, Matt Taylor, and then, of course, Rick Venturi as our analyst. So that is Sunday, 425 at Lucas Oil Stadium. Hey, let's hope we're talking more football in the month of January, Matt. Absolutely. Let's do it. Let's get one.